It's a great pleasure to host today uh, and also introduce Dr. Sydney McElroy and Justin McElroy. Dr. Sydney McElroy is a family physician and assistant professor at the Marshall University of School of Medicine and the co-host of Still Buffering, a sibling's guide to teens through the ages. She graduated with a BS in biology and she received her MD from the Marshall University. Justin McElroy is a co-host of podcasts like My Brother, My Brother and Me, which is a basis for a TV adaptation by NBC Universal and The Adventure Zone, which is also a New York Times best-selling book series and option for an animated series for Peacock. His voice acting has appeared in OKKO, OK Apple and Onion, and Trolls World Tour. He also worked with his family on graphic novel adaptations of The Adventure Zone, a Marvel Comics miniseries, Journey into Mystery, and a book entitled Everybody Has a Podcast Except You. He graduated from Marshall University with a BFA in acting and directing. Dr. Sidney and Justin McElroy co-created Soul Bones, a marital tour of misguided medicine, the world's most popular medical podcast. And in 2018, they released the Soul Bones, Soul Bones book, which became a New York Times bestseller and is available in paperback now. Uh, we are very happy to have you here today, Sydney and Justin. So please go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I believe we're unmuted. Hi, everybody. Hey, I'm uh, Justin McElroy. I'm Sydney McElroy. Uh, boy, my credits usually seem more impressive when they're not, when the doctor stuff isn't before it, because in context, <laughs> it starts to feel a little silly, actually, now that I think about it. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, so we host a podcast called Sawbones. It's a medical history show that we've been doing since. 2013 mm -hmm. believe it or not that's right uh and uh we were thank you so much first off to, to dr Rella for uh inviting us this is a great honor mm -hmm. um especially to be talking to the kidney people because god if the liver doctors had asked <laughs> no way i'm assuming you guys hate liver doctors this is a guess that i've made on no basis whatsoever but if some like liver doctor jokes would be funny in this context please let me know i don't know any but i can try to I, gen some up i have found that as a physician a lot of people will ask me oh is your spouse in the medical world too and i always say no about as far from it is i'm trying <laughs> i'm working on an, an honorary doctorate which means that I have been asking a lot of people to give me an honorary doctorate and no one has uh, acquiesced to this point. Yeah, keep trying. Yeah. Keep, we Keep hope alive. We, we, we've got a great story for you though, that we, yes. we figured if we we're going to come here, we might as well do something akin to our uh, medical history uh, podcast. Yes. So that's what, that's what we love to do on our show. I look up uh, stories from medical history and research sort of how we used to treat disease or diagnose or, how something came to be. And then um, I'm going to share it with you today as well as Justin. Mm -hmm. Usually he doesn't know a ton about no. any of this stuff. No, so. I'm strictly eye candy, which considering <laughs> it's a podcast is hurtful, but I, I try to move forward. So I thought uh, it would be maybe refreshing to focus on a, a sort of global health challenge from our past as opposed to our present today. And I want to tell you the story of parrot fever. I should preface with, if if you love parrots, if they're your favorite animal, this might be a tough story to hear. You might also be a parrot or Jimmy Buffett. And if so, welcome. <laughs> what an honor it is to have either of you here. Now, the, the name of the disease, the scientific name, of course, is not parrot fever. That's what we like to call it. But psittacosis is, of course, uh, of course obviously you knew that, is what the scientific name is. Um, it's derived from the Greek word, uh, Sitikos, which of course means parrot. So it's still parrot fever either way. It just sounds a lot more impressive, I think. That's a that's a science trick, Justin. Just use the Latin and make it or the uh, Greek or whatever. Whatever yes. the and then yeah. and then you won't know what I'm saying. Uh Psittacosis, of course, is a bacterial infection and it can manifest in a variety of ways in humans. The causative organism chlamydia uh psittaci is a it's a very small gram negative gram negative intracellular bacteria and the, the reason that's important justin um you'll you'll find out later it's hard to find oh yeah yeah it's a rare one huh it, well i mean a collector's item no no <laughs> it can be hard to isolate uh especially back when this story takes place to actually find the organism and grow it on a culture can be very challenging you know normally during sawbone sid i play the role of the layman who asks you to slow down and explain the scientific concepts in layman's terms 
uh, in this particular audience, I am feeling somewhat vestigial. You, sh you shouldn't need to do that. Yeah, it's hoping. <laughs> The most likely uh, presentation, should you unfortunately get psittacosis, would be fevers, chills, headaches, a cough. Um, it can result in much more serious infections, especially pneumonia, and we'll we'll talk about that quite a bit. Uh, infection of the liver, even even some uh, infection of the heart valves, mm -hmm. endocarditis in mm -hmm. some cases. So it it can be a big deal. Um, the way that you get psittacosis is is pretty unpleasant, I would say. You know, from parrots? Well, yes, uh, but how do you get it from the bird? Kissing. Well, you say that as a joke, but um, I'm not suggesting oh, not, that. No. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, although there's nothing funny about the, kissing your birds. It's no, a tender the, expression of your love for them. The centers for the, the CDC does mention one possible route of exposure is direct beak to mouth contact. So I, I that would or kissing your bird does. Now, I yeah. know among your favorite routes, fecal oral is up there. Mm -hmm. now, That's usually where my does favorite beak, route. Where does beak to mouth rank mm -hmm. against fecal oral in terms of routes? Not my things, favorite. Not your favorite. <laughs> uh, generally, it's actually spread by inhaling the dried bird droppings. Mm. So they dry out, they get kind of powdered and poof up in the air, like if you're cleaning the cage or something and you breathe them in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> inhale them deeply. Uh, most of the people, as you can imagine, who get parrot fever are probably people who own parrots. If you don't own the parrots and you're getting parrot fever, that is actually very suspicious. The, there are unfortunate pet shop employees who occasionally ah, okay. contract the infection. Um, and while we, we blame parrots for it, they get the name, they get the blame. It, there are actually other birds that can get and give you psittacosis as well. So there, there, parakeets, macaws, cockatiels, even chickens and turkeys. But they can't speak to defend themselves. So it doesn't seem fair to blame <laughs> them. Uh, it's a fairly rare condition. And luckily now, if someone gets psittacosis, it's very treatable because we live in the era of antibiotics. And so mm. this is not an infection that need be fatal for, for the vast majority of patients, which is great. But that that wasn't the case uh, in this incident that we're going to discuss. We knew that there was something like psittacosis ever since the French microbiologist Edmund Nocard studied it back in the late 1800s. But the organism that he isolated that he thought caused parrot fever was a bacillus. Uh, and he, he sort of found it and said, this, this has got to be it. This is what causes this entity that, you know, comes from birds and makes humans sick. Um, but there wasn't a lot written about it after that. It was just sort of this thing we kind of knew about, but we didn't have a lot of information on, um, is this in fact the correct organism? And what do we Probably do about it? a lot fewer it? parrots running around back then, I have to guess. Well, up until 1929, <laughs> perhaps. 1929? Was that a big parrot year? I, I guess it was. In 1929, it was a big year for people to want parrots. I don't know if there was an ad campaign. That I don't know. It's the, it was the stock market crash. People were just feeling despondent. They needed something to cheer them up. It seems like an odd time to spend your money on something as frivolous as a parrot. It was like the tulip crash that people were just buying parrots as oh. an investment, thinking, oh, the price of these things is going to go up. Okay. But there's all of a sudden there's so many parrots. That... So there was a large shipment of Brazilian birds that arrived in Argentina in 1929 um, to be sold from there to whoever wanted to buy these birds, I guess. You know, <laughs> bird, bird fans. Yes, bird fans. The problem was these were sick birds. Mm. Uh, and the bird salesman may have known that, may have realized that, uh, as as I will go to explain, as I will go to explain, it it I think is obvious when a bird has psittacosis. I think mm. you can tell why well, if you're a bird person. Yeah, or a bird. Um, but the bird salesman sold them anyway and did not inform anyone that uh, the birds were sick. And it took a little bit, but then all of a sudden people started getting sick, specifically people who had bought these birds mm. started getting sick. And it it reached a level uh, where it was actually covered in the media because there was an Argentinian actor who played a sailor in his, one of his roles and used a live parrot as part of his performance. And so 
presumably he got sick from the parrot mm -hmm. and that kind of rose to a level where people were talking about it some there were some stories written about it um and this started to put the pieces together as uh unlucky parrot buyers in 12 different countries reported cases uh, of this new mysterious illness mm. so so really all over the globe people were getting sick um and because of this one actor they started to you know, he, was, they he, was like the, he was like the poster boy of parrot fever. <laughs> Finally, there was a face to this disease. Well, I think it's really interesting because nowadays the idea that everybody would be talking about it on, you know, in the media, on the internet, on social media, whatever, seems very obvious. But in 1929, this, you know, not everything would have risen to that level of, of notoriety or significance. Now to, these days, if we want to complain about our bird diseases, we go to Twitter. Because yeah. bird does the bird app Stupid. twitter mm -hmm. in the usa uh simon martin who was the secretary of the annapolis chamber of commerce had bought a parrot for his wife for christmas i'm guessing she wanted one it's such a big swing as a gift i mean it's mm -hmm. like you're making some unless that person has expressly in writing expressed their desire to own a parrot i feel like you are taking a massive leap massive leap with that kind of thing. well and I, I you gotta assume that he knew her because like i know you well enough to know that if i bought you a bird you would be would so mad out. at me i would move yeah. out <laughs> i'd move out that'd be in the podcast end of family but that's it no 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 future for us so he he got her a bird um but he didn't want to ruin the surprise he, he purchased the bird prior to christmas uh but he wanted he asked his daughter and his son-in-law can you keep this bird at your place until christmas um so that she'll be surprised uh, unfortunately, the poor parrot did not make it to Christmas. Oh. No, the parrot passed away before Christmas came. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough. Now he has to find a last minute present. Where are you <laughs> going to find something in Annapolis a few days before Christmas? You're going to have this great parrot. Honey, I got you a cage. What's this for? I, I actually thought you'll have to figure that out, but it is for you. Just something that goes in a case. Something that goes in a, it's a promise. Uh, it's like an O. Henry story. <laughs> so not only had the parrot died, but now the daughter and her husband were also sick. So this really wrecked Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Monty Python hadn't even been invented yet. So there were no like great, easy dead parrot sketch gags to fly around. I wonder if that inspired, no, no probably not. Probably not. When, so when their family doctor, so they went to their doctor and they, they said, I don't know what this all means, but we're all sick. Here are our symptoms. We had this bird that also died. Does any of this make any sense to you? The doctor initially was kind of puzzled, like, well, no, I, I'm not quite sure what this all could be. But then his wife, who I guess he, I guess he, the, you know, this is pre HIPAA. So he went home and told his wife about it. <laughs> So that was okay back then. Uh, so he he was telling his wife about it. And his wife said, you know, this is interesting. I read in the newspaper about some cases of some weird bird sickness down in Argentina. And I think it was connected to parrots. I think maybe this, this has something to do with it. Hmm. Um, so because his wife had read that newspaper article, it sort it of cracked the, the case, huh. made the connection. Uh, and he alerted the U.S. Public Health Service that hey, I think that there's a weird epidemic here. I think we've got- We got a parrot problem. We, yeah, we got a parrot problem. Uh, and through uh, Martin, the mayor of Baltimore was alerted to the outbreak and then the governor of Maryland was alerted to the outbreak. And so things begin to rise up the ranks uh, of public health notice, you know, something needs to be done. This is bigger than, this is bigger than one parrot. <laughs> this is way, this goes all the way to the top. This is going to be a much bigger job than for one parrot. So two things begin to happen at this point in the story. Um, one part of it is the is really the panic that happens at this point, the parrot panic that will follow. And, and it was at the time a, a, a huge sort of hysteria across the country about parrots. Um, the other is the science that had to start happening to try to crack this case and figure out what was going on. I wanna start with the panic because I like to save the best for last. Sure, and, and the science is the, the best for us kind of science people. That's the best all part. All of us the here on this Zoom. The science is the more interesting part. So first of all- We the... get it in a way that the liver doctors will never <laughs> understand. A liver doctor would want you to start with the science because they don't get it. 
Um, I'm going to defend just on principle liver, liver doctors, just to make it clear that you no. don't actually have a problem. I don't know. I don't know why I've got so much bile for liver doctors. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> that wasn't bad. I mean, in grants, sorry, in the grand scheme, that wasn't bad. I've been saving it for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like, you got a little, we can get some for humorous medicine in there. Humors, humorous, humor, for humors, so, bile. I love mm-hmm. it. So city and state health departments sprang into action to try to understand and inform the public. And of course, a lot of different levels got involved. The the National Health Service, representatives from the Army and the Navy. Um, Annapolis kind of became the center of all of this because there was an outbreak there. Um, The pet shop where the parrot had been sold started receiving all these calls because of all this interest and saying, hey, um, did is my bird, do you think my bird's sick? Should I bring my bird in? Or I got something from you or what, you know, mm-hmm. people were really concerned. Um, they, uh, they were, they knew that this was somehow connected to birds, but they really didn't know which birds or mm-hmm. what to do about the birds or like, how did you get it? Could, could you keep a bird? You know, you might love your pet bird. Was there, what, a, what advice could authorities give to people who had these birds? Uh, and since they didn't know, they they basically said, I guess, do you really need the bird? I guess we get rid of all birds. I guess you should get rid of your bird. Uh, so at this point, there was actually advice that was issued for like, especially like sailors to just, why don't you just sort of toss the birds overboard? Now that maybe. had to be a frustrating afternoon because you throw the parrot <laughs> And the parrot comes back. Said, no, you don't understand. I'm throwing you in the sea. Chuck I flies this, back. I've thought this through. I'm assuming it had to have been in a cage. Okay. Uh-huh. That's really grim. Mine was kind of a fun energy. Uh-huh. And then you came in with like an actually pretty depressing energy. Uh, but I mean, go on. I like, like to problem solve. Yeah. Some pet owners just went outside and set their parrots free, which didn't seem like a great. Parrots are like, yeah, that thank you. <laughs> This is great. This is great for me. Parrots were roaming free. There were some authorities that said, you know, you just need to find a humane way to put your parrot down, whether it's sick or not, because we don't really understand exactly what's happening. And we know that people are getting sick Um, because there was all of this panic and fear and people, you know, murdering their pets. um, There were there was obviously some misinformation and we know all about that now. Right. When the public starts to panic, when people are afraid of something, especially something new and scientific that they don't really understand, a lot of misinformation will spread. Gossip. I I can't think of a current example to draw a parallel to, but I'm sure. Not a single one. Not a single (laughs) one. Not a single current example. Uh, Just like now, also then, um, people began to hear these rumors. In Toledo, it was reported that an elderly woman had died of pneumonia just days after her her husband had brought her two Cuban parrots. And that must have been the culprit. Um, In Baltimore, there was another elderly woman who died of pneumonia. And everybody knew she didn't have any birds, but this rumor started to circulate that I'm pretty sure I saw her touch a parrot though the other day at her friend's house. And all of this kind of like panicked reporting led to all these false alarms of outbreaks uh, in various places. People said, I think I saw her touch a parrot at her friend's house. That's (laughs) what they said. Well, I don't know. (laughs) They said they thought she touched a parrot. I added the at her friend's house. We used to start color. those kinds of rumors in elementary school. You know, I hear Kevin touched a parrot. Don't <laughs> pass it on. So uh, everybody sort of started panicking. And, he, and then the evening news started running reports um, to update us on healthy birds. Like, don't worry. Uh, uh, this evening, we'd like to report to you that the following parrots were found to be healthy. Mr. Bingles. <laughs> Topo, George the parrot. You didn't go for Polly. Polly, that would be so obvious. Right. All, the, mm-hmm. all the Pollys had the illness, so, I assume. So they started reporting local parrot doesn't have illness as far as we know. Hero, we think parrot. We guess. Hero parrot, immune. Now, I I had to look this up because I doctor humans. I don't doctor animals. And I didn't know how to tell if a parrot had parrot fever. I've never owned one. I've never treated a sick parrot. Uh, apparently sick parrots will have puffy eyes. They'll be lethargic. They'll lose their appetite. 
their feathers will look all fluffed out. They can get a runny nose and they can get an enlarged liver. So if the, if the parrot looks like it's been on a bender for a few days, that, that might be something. To that might about. be it. I don't know how, if you are a pet owner, a bird owner, I don't know how you are expected to palpate the liver to tell if it's enlarged. So I would go off the other, yeah, the other symptoms the other myself. Symptoms, yeah. Who knows where the bird's liver is? <laughs> now, of course, government authorities tried to calm the panic and reassure everyone that, look, yes, obviously there is some something going on with the parrots, but we don't need to freak out. Everybody calm down. Um, they started to sort of go on like a PR campaign, like four parrots at first. There was the health officer uh, for D.C., Dr. William Fowler, who posed for a newspaper photo, like holding his pet parrot. <laughs> Why did um, we care? Why did we care? And I, telling everybody like, I love this parrot. I would never get rid of this parrot. He's fine. Don't worry. It's weird that our government cared so much about this. Like, <laughs> it's not like these are a cash crop for us, right? It's not like people were worried about their pet tobacco giving, getting them <laughs> sick, right? You don't need to, to, to do a good PR campaign for parrots. I mean, have them or don't. Like, I don't understand why we, why we cared about this. It was a rough time. Yeah, you know, that's 1929. True. You don't want people to, they, they might love their, I'm assuming parrots were very fashionable is my guess. Um, And it wasn't just parrots, right? Like people were scared of, their birds in general. And one thing that was apparently really big at this point were lovebirds, like little, little birds, like we mentioned earlier, like a cockatiel or something that you would own that, um, especially for like older women, um, they were very popular as like a present for someone who'd lost their spouse, like a widow, like here's a, a bird for you to care for. And so don't breathe its poop. Pet though, lovers don't want to give up their pets. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people were really upset and scared. And, um, but no one could deny that the number of sick parrots kept going up. They kept finding more sick well, birds. I know what we said, folks, but listen, and the number, parrots keep getting sick. The number of sick people kept going up. And it wasn't just happening in the U.S. You know, my, our story focuses on the U.S., but it was happening in multiple places all over the world. So by late January, uh, President Herbert Hoover took the action of blocking the importation of parrots to the U.S., uh, which I mean, tough, really tough, but fair scared a lot of people. Cause it's like, okay, well, apparently there is a problem. The president said we can't have parrots. <laughs> uh, now a lot of people, and if you can believe it back then, that was the wildest thing that the president did. <laughs> if that, that actually would make the news. That was, that was the wildest executive order. Probably. Yeah. So when people's pet birds did pass away or whatever happened to them, um, they wanted to be helpful, right? They knew that there was some kind of outbreak. They knew that scientists were, were trying to figure out what's going on with the parrots and how do we fix this? And so they started shipping off their um, deceased parrots to Washington. <laughs> Dear government, <laughs> please take my parrot and I hope this helps. Uh, so who was at the other end receiving all of these, all of these unfortunate Christmas presents? um a parrot farm no let's no. get to the science the fun right. part uh first of all dr george mccoy who was the director of the hygienic laboratory at the time uh he had been directed by the surgeon general who called him up and said dr mccoy look we got to put some brains on this parrot thing all right we need a we need a parrot task force we need some research going i don't i don't know what the heck's going on here but um get a guy who's going to be the expert so in early January of 1930, he called up Dr. Charles Armstrong and said, hey, guess what? You're an expert on parrot fever. Congratulations. Um, which, you know, at the time, like nobody was an expert on parrot fever yet. Uh, no, nobody even knew for sure what it was and they had the wrong organism. And so uh, he got Dr. Armstrong. He had actually been working at the time on some um, post smallpox vaccine complications. And he said, you're going to put away that research for now and you're going to come study some birds. Um, that thing sounds not that important, <laughs> but uh, come work on this bird problem. It was, well, it was, a, and at first, you know, he wasn't thrilled because he wasn't, this wasn't his area of expertise, but he, he knew he was going to be put on the hook to be the expert, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a fun position to be in. Um, and also like it probably did. He, he knew that on the front, it's going to involve working with a bunch of birds. Yeah. Parrots don't like to be put through scientific experiments as we will see. Uh, it is worth noting too, that at this point in history, when we talk about the hygienic laboratory, 
It was uh, hygienic in name only. Uh, the researchers there were of the mindset that, you know, when it comes to scientific progress, you can't be so careful that you waste time and not get the answers you need in time to help people. And also, if you if you're if you take too much time with a bunch of like cleaning protocols and wearing gloves and all those sorts of things, someone else might beat you to the solution. And to be fair, at 19 in 1930, we didn't know all that we know now about, you know, how to keep a laboratory area and, and yourself clean and safe, you know, you're saying, sanitary. You're saying they were nasty. <laughs> the nasty boys and girls of science. I'm just saying that it was it was also accepted, you know, at this point, a lot of the researchers who were, who were doing the work there did get sick from the things that they studied. Uh, and mm -hmm. that was just sort of part of the part of the job that was a job hazard mm -hmm. then um and and in some ways i would i would dare to suggest maybe like a badge of honor that you had you know you were fighting these diseases to save mankind and you had the you know, you, scars to show it you know right, that, we saw that a lot with yellow fever mm -hmm. like it, for explorers yes. and stuff like that like oh yeah i got it i, I beat it that was a big uh, a big thing there people having bragging rights from from beating yellow fever well and it's true you know it, it, we've talked about this on the show before it wasn't just true at this point in history for uh scientists who were doing the research but doctors had this you know medical doctors had this long time period where having like a, a dirty bloody coat and hands was a mark of what a great <laughs> doctor you were so yeah you know i think I, I don't know what's up with us over in science mm. I don't know what our thing is. Anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad, we don't do that anymore. I'm glad, except for liver doctors, obviously. No. <laughs> but uh, the other thing is there there weren't a lot of, as you can imagine, there weren't a lot of government dollars floating around to support a lot of this scientific research. Um, the nation was reeling from the stock market crash. Money was pretty tight. Uh, if you wanted to get your piece of that pie, you you had to have exciting results and you had to have them fast. So. In, in one sense, this was a really good opportunity for the hygienic laboratory because parrot fever was very much in the national spotlight. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the guys up top very much wanted answers to calm everybody down and I guess allow for the safe importation of parrots once more. Uh, so this was a good thing to try to fix if you could. So Dr. Armstrong and his assistant, Henry Anderson, tried to take some precautions as they set to work in, and they had sort of like two basement rooms in the hygienic lab where they did all of this research. Um, they did wear gloves and aprons and they did like douse the floor mats and disinfectant and had like disinfectant so curtains that they sort of tried to hang up around the parrots. The parrots were really tough to deal with though. They're mean, um, mean birds. Yes, I get, well, I don't know. I don't wanna say they're mean birds. They don't like being in cages. You know, oh, who does? Um, and especially like the, the cages that they kept them in, they had, they just made them themselves. They fashioned them out of trash cans with like wire mesh mm -hmm. over the top. And that's where they kept all the parrots. That seems like we could get some funding going there. I'm, I, well, they we, didn't have it. Well, the nation is apparently just chock full of empty parrot cages at this point. I would assume it wouldn't be that hard to find some. You know, that's true. Just ask, hey, if you got but an empty were, parrot, they, parrot cage, bring it on down. Maybe they were infected, though. No, we, we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, so they they made these parrot cages, um, but the birds escaped frequently. Because of the fake trash can cages. <laughs> well, and I guess parrots are tough. I don't know. Tough? Like, they're just like, I mean, like, they're, they fight back. <laughs> they're not docile. <laughs> they're resourceful. <laughs> they're resourceful birds. Uh, Cunning, they, resourceful birds. And when they wanted something, they they would bite. They would scratch. They would just make a mess of the place. Get their droppings everywhere. Maybe we should so, stop capturing and uh, making pets out of parrots. They sound terrible. <laughs> we should just give up. So they began trying to. So they had their parrots. They had their lab. They began trying to infect healthy birds with material from sick birds that was the that was kind of the first step let's see if it spreads parrot to parrot how does this work so they got uh one of the dead birds from a dr william royal stokes who was the city bacteriologist in baltimore um and they they took this bird they took some material from it and they uh for some of the birds the healthy birds they would inject it into them 
Uh, for other birds, they would just sort of put bits in the cages, um, basically trying to work through Koch's postulates, right? Like we're going to try to isolate this organism. We're going to try to put get put it into another healthy organism or animal and see if it gets sick. You know, that they're, they're doing the thing. They're Koch, doing the science. Koch postulates. You know. Of course. They're trying to prove that it's infectious, find the organism, figure it out. It didn't take long for the birds to get sick. So that that was a really like highlight of these early exper experiments is that they were able to very quickly make birds sick. A huge accomplishment in, by any, I, by any metric. Science is weird. When you're watching the sausage get made, sometimes yeah. it can be weird. Uh, however, the other part of it, the quest to isolate this microbe was proving more difficult. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the organisms seemed to be smaller than they had anticipated, especially since they were kind of going off of this, I guess you could call it bad intel, <laughs> um, that it was this bacillus that Nocard had found years ago. Um, what they were finding is that as they took the material and then pat, what they would do is like pass it through a filter um, and then give it to a bird and see if they got sick and keep passing it through smaller filters to mm. see how small, does that make sense to yeah. see how small the organism was? Uh, and so as they were doing that, they, they still were able to infect birds, even as they passed it through filters that they thought should have caught the organism. They thought should have filtered out the organism. Mm. The birds were still getting sick and they couldn't visualize it very easily in any of the samples they were sending. What they would do is prepare these samples and then send them upstairs to the other research scientists upstairs to look at it and try to find it um, or to try to grow it on, right on a culture media. So then they would try to grow it on all these different medias. And it was just really proving challenging this, hmm. this, this organism for a while, they thought, well, maybe it's a virus. It's so small and we just can't grow it. Maybe we're dealing with a virus here and not a bacteria after all to make matters worse on January 25th, Armstrong arrived at the lab to find Anderson quite ill oh man yes saw this coming yes uh he was hospitalized soon after that with all of the you know distinct symptoms i mean he knew they they knew yeah. they knew what was going on he had the headache he had the fevers um and from the beginning they started doing these chest x-rays and they as time would progress they could watch the pneumonia worsening first in one lung and then in the other lung and you know filling up the lungs there was no doubt that he had caught parrot fever. So now Anderson is ill in the hospital and Armstrong is on his own to continue this research. Well, Dr. McCoy said, but that's not going to work. You need more help. And this is obviously something that, you know, time is of the essence. So yeah. we, you need an assistant. And there were lots of, by the way, researchers who would have happily done that, who had, you know, sort of the, the early, um, like microbe hunters who, wanted this job who wanted to be on the front lines of this and who were who were ready to go down and assist armstrong and, and take over the research thank goodness for them not yes. my i can't say i understand it but hey i appreciate them for sure uh dr mccoy decided that he would take it upon himself to go downstairs mm. and to those basement rooms and work alongside uh dr armstrong to try to find the organism and so Captain kirk used to do that all the time they would really? go to a hostile planet and I would, they'd have a bunch of red shirts and captain kirk would be like i'm going to and nobody was ever like hey, probably you shouldn't because you do need to do the whole uh spaceship and be the captain of it he's like no 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 i'll go down and check it out it'll be fine and it wasn't ever fine because there would always be a couple people on the team who you knew they were gonna they were the ones that were gonna fall into the the pit or get uh -huh. eaten by the space dragon or whatever never captain kirk no. But his presence there, I, I feel like, increased the danger. And it was also pretty reckless. Um, this Ironically, is... the doctor on the ship was Dr. McCoy. Really? Who is, yeah. Who maybe is named in his honor. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. But this is foreshadowing. What oh, you have just set up. Oh, my. Okay. This is interesting. I love it. Because, uh, so Dr. McCoy, who, I mean, I, and I do think it's sort of remarkable because he was, I mean, he was the general, so to speak. You know, he was the, the one in charge. He was the director of the lab taking it upon himself to go down into that basement and do this work alongside Armstrong. Um, they began to, to continue the work with the infection and dissection of the birds and investigation, try to find where is the organism and, and all of this. And, and even with other lab animals, they begin to add, you know, downstairs, try to infect other things. And um, as they're doing this work, frighteningly on February 6th, 
Dr. Armstrong noticed he had a chill. Uh Uh-oh. Yes. By the next day, his appetite was gone. Uh, and so he snuck away. I can picture this too, being a, being a physician and, and going through residency and never knowing that, oh, being sick is such a big deal. So he snuck away and he checked his temperature and he had a fever of 102. Oh. And he, he knew what was about to happen, very much like you just described. Yeah, parrots. In your star show. Uh, by the 8th, the same day that unfortunately Henry Anderson would actually perish from the disease. Wow. Now, Dr. Armstrong is actually hospitalized as well. I leaving... feel like if you had let me know the stakes would be this high at the beginning, I would have made so many jokes. Now I'm feeling like kind of a horse's patoot. Who knew it would get this dire? Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. Let's soldier on. Uh, th- this is medical history. But I, you I know. know. There's you know how it goes. Littered, littered with bodies. So Dr. McCoy is now down there in those basement rooms alone having to suss this whole thing out and of course again all of these other researchers you know stepped up and said hey we'll we'll help do you want us to come down do you want us to help we're not afraid and uh he wouldn't let anybody come down he he found ways to sort of like partially sedate the parrots like little like cotton balls soaked in ether that he could kind of like so they really were to make really him were, chill before he got them those really were on a bender <laughs> the parrots <laughs> getting drunk is not a <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, ways to make them more manageable uh, so that he could do this work single handedly, because that would have been very difficult. Sure, and yeah. and the weight of the, you know, government expectations and then like the country is on your shoulders. Um, and the, like the Surgeon General is calling him periodically to be like, what's uh, how's how are things going down there? McCoy Mac is what they always call him in all the conversations i read how things going mac you got it got any progress yet (laughs) the president's getting mad uh so he reached out to him the surgeon general reached out to mccoy about dr armstrong in the hospital and said you know uh why don't we try some serum do you think that would work and so they knew at the time that sometimes you could take let's say that you already had parrot fever and got better Mm -hmm. and now i was sick with parrot fever the idea was could we take some of some serum from you and inject it into me. What serum? Like part of your blood. Okay. Could we take it from you, inject it into me, and make me better? Would that be a treatment for it? Uh, and they had tried that with other things. And so they said, hey, do you think it might be worth a try? And, you know, Dr. McCoy was a little skeptical about it. They had tried similar things among the lab animals and had never really seen much much success with it. So he was kind of skeptical, but he said, you know what? I I'm really worried about Dr. Armstrong and obviously we don't have a great way to fight this. It's 1930. So yeah, let's do it. So they actually sent Dr. Roscoe Spencer, who was the doctor who studied, who studied Rocky mountain spotted fever. Oh yeah, sure. um, Out to find some. So he basically had to go, they had names of, of patients who had had and recovered from parrot fever uh, around Baltimore. And so he went around Baltimore door to door, (laughs) knocking and asking, hi, I understand you survived parrot fever. Can I have some of your blood? That's it. That was the question. Um, And he explained, you know, we're trying to save someone's life. We don't know if it will work, but it's our only chance. Um, And he offered payment. And surprisingly, a lot of people said no. Lame. I know. Well, I thought that I thought that was strange. I'd want to get in the history books. It's the guy who heroically gave up his blood. Yeah. And who loved parrots just a bit too much. But at, at the time, a lot of people were very um, put off by this request. No, 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 I'm I'm good. I'll actually keep my blood. And some of them did have that sort of excuse. They had just recently recovered from parrot fever. They were still quite, you know, sickly, They don't know how fatigued. blood works. They don't know right. how much of it they need. Well, and we're still, yeah, well, I mean, we're still like the the effects of like the four humors and how much blood you need and like all that kind of stuff is still wearing off at this point. Yeah. Like science might know, but- the average layperson maybe didn't. So giving up some blood seemed scary. Finally, they found um, a woman who was willing, an, an elderly woman who still recently recovered, still sort of weak, but if this meant maybe a life could be saved, was willing to do so. Nice. So uh, gave Spencer some of her blood, refused payment, um, 
and they took it to Armstrong. So at this point to hear, and you can read Armstrong's account of being sick, having parrot fever and what that was like. At this point, he says, basically he, he's describing he was delirious. Uh, he, he was completely out of touch with what was happening around him. He talks about feeling like he was a balloon floating above everyone and he couldn't quite tell what was happening. Um, he was quite sick, probably mm. a very high fever. Uh, the serum arrived and they begin to give him doses of it, basically. Uh, and according to him, he noticed a change pretty quickly. He said that within a day of the first dose, he slept well for the first time. Um, and then even though it would take many weeks for him to completely recover, he did keep getting better. Hmm. Uh, so this was good, right? Armstrong seems to be turning the corner. He seems to be recovering. That's a good thing. He's still no, nowhere well enough to come you know, right. help McCoy in the lab. Um, and I should note at this point that this sounds like the serum fixed him, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. But see, everybody else here knows that that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> okay. I'll be, I'll be the, uh, the patsy for everybody. Else because then. you can't, you can't do the, cause you can't do an experiment that way. Right. Like we watched that happen over and over again over the last year where somebody got some sort of medicine, then they got better. Mm. And they said it was a miracle cure. It's the hiccup. It's the hiccup thing. Whatever you did, the last thing before your hiccups hiccup. went away is a hiccup cure. Yes. And and it's and it's interesting because um after all would be said and done, there were a lot of sort of like serum fans who had been converted by witnessing this and were like, this must have done it. This must have done it. And McCoy was the one who was the most skeptical, which is something he was known for, like finding the quacks and really coming after the you would have liked this guy I feel I, like I, I feel like would. yeah but um anyway whether or not you know the serum actually worked he did in fact get better um even though they didn't really do a study and there was no control group <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> even as mccoy started to figure out how to one-handedly catch a parrot sedate a parrot um, or infect a parrot. Hmm. Um, that's when disaster really struck. So he he was he was finding his groove, and then unfortunately, and even the public panic had started to kind of abate. They were moving on to other things. I, I'm sure other, I don't know, celebrity gossip, whatever, <laughs> whatever everybody wants to talk about. Uh, but at this point, that is when the real concern began to be isolated in the hygienic lab itself. Over the course of that month, as McCoy was working alone in the basement, 11 of the lab employees would fall ill with parrot fever. Yikes. Right. Uh, and what was really disturbing is that initially when Anderson got sick, when Armstrong got sick, the thought was, well, I mean, they were right there in the room with the parrots, right? They were touching the parrots. They were probably being like scratched or bitten by the parrots. They, you know, they were handling the parrot material. Mm. Of course they got sick. Sure. That makes sense. That, that was not... Uh, scary in that sense. However, the employees that started getting sick next had not necessarily had this kind of contact with the parrots. Hmm. Some of them had been in the basement, but not in those rooms at all, maybe in a room across the hallway or something like that. Other employees that started getting sick had not even been downstairs. They had simply been examining maybe some samples that were sent upstairs to the lab you know, to, to, for further examination, but like they had never even been down there. So it was more, it seemed to be more contagious than they had. It was more contagious. Thought. Yes. And this really started to worry McCoy that at this point, we don't have this thing under control. We're still not sure what We've it brought is. So many parrots into this building. I don't <laughs> know what we're thinking. Why do we need so many? So many parrots and so many other am animals that were down there that were being infected. I mean, there were a lot of animals down there, a lot of animals. <laughs> This is made clear. I don't want to get gruesome. There are some really gruesome descriptions of what comes next out there that I will not uh. share with everyone. Anyway, he he felt like he, this was more than he had bargained for. Um, they, on one hand, as all these people were getting sick and going to the hospital, they were rounding up more convalescent serum, more, you know, to try to keep treating people. And that was fine on that end. He wasn't going to mess with that. But he had to do what he had to do when it came to the building itself. We couldn't let this outbreak spread any further. We clearly don't understand this well enough to control it. There's only one option. I can't, I can't imagine. I can't fathom. So on Saturday, March 15th of 1930, McCoy cleared the building. 
He went about destroying every test subject. I worded that as it's very yes, yeah, sanitized as, as I could. Yeah. Um, and incinerating everyone uh, that was we left did, inside. We did the warn you to be fair. Mm -hmm. He disinfected every surface of the of the parrot rooms, as they were. And then once every once all of that was done and all the the animals had been laid to rest, uh, he he had everyone leave the building. He called in uh, the fumigation squad, and the entire building was fumigated with cyanide gas to clear out basically every last creeping crawling. Just everything, huh? There's nothing. Yeah, nothing's gonna do well in that yes. environment. It is said, and this may. This may not be true. This may just be a uh, folk legend, but it is said that sparrows flying 50 feet over the building dropped out of the air. So much gas <laughs> was used. Wait, it takes us so long to learn how to preserve life, but when it comes to eradicating life, don't worry. <laughs> us human beings have it covered. We are, we are going to handle that with a plum. So after that, uh, they decided that they needed to move the research somewhere else. They actually, by the time Armstrong fully recovered, they had him move his operation out to the, the Curtis Bay quarantine station near Baltimore to just continue to research the illness and the organism. And actually around this same time, you'll find, and this happens, we talk about this a lot on the show, that like the organism was isolated by different people in different parts of the world yeah, around the same common phenomenon. time. Yeah, a lot of people get credit because it happened so close together, which made sense. Everybody was trying to find it at around the same time and you know sometimes sharing information sometimes not um but anyway they realized that it is not the culprit that no card had suspected that mm. was never what they were looking for they were looking for this completely other very tiny bacteria that, that we've already talked about um they knew it was spread from parrot to person not from person to person they figured that out and that it was probably from all the dried parrot material that had been sort of you know aerosolized yeah. uh, by everything that was going on. The outbreak in the U.S. would eventually cause uh, a total of 167 cases and 33 deaths. So <sighs> yeah, a, a pretty scary, not, not a huge case number, but still scary nonetheless. Um, one interesting late case before we end this story, one interesting late case came two years later, 1932. Uh, the wife of Senator William Bora, who was one of the senators from Idaho, uh, owned lovebirds and was a big fan of her lovebirds and became ill with what they realized pretty quickly was psittacosis, was parrot fever. Uh, she became very ill, was hospitalized, and it did not seem that she was going to survive this illness. So desperate to save her, the senator reached out uh, to the hygienic lab to say, hey, do you have any more of that serum? from when this was a problem before. Do you, have you saved any that we could give her and see if maybe that would help? Because, you know, she, she's getting worse. The doctors don't know what else to do. And, and basically I'm really scared. Yeah. Uh, so they, he reached out and unfortunately they hadn't kept any, ah. but Dr. Armstrong still worked there. Oh yeah. So he could have used his blood. Well, yeah, that was the next part of the story. Yeah. I, I, figured it, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I leapt to it, but yeah. So yes, Dr. Armstrong rolled up his sleeve and let them take some of his blood. Um, it's funny because I guess the like the media covered the path of this blood like from DC to Boise <laughs> the whole way. Uh, as it Hero was being blood taken. continues its cross country journey today. They must have been bored again. Traveling through Wichita, this this uh, feisty test tube is headed towards heroism. Um, so her doctors actually even argued over whether or not they should give it to her because they were like, listen, this it's isn't really gonna, old. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah, this isn't going to help. And I, it's just I'm sorry, sir. She's she's too far gone. It's too late. We, this isn't going to do it. Uh, but despite all that, the one of the doctors, the, one of the younger doctors, I guess, convinced them like, well, we got to give it a try. It's this, it's this or nothing. We got to give it a try. So they did. And she eventually turned around and recovered from parrot fever again well, that's scientifically proven now because if it happens once no. <laughs> that's a miracle it happens twice that's science that so is that's not, concrete that's anecdotals actually, once that's, scientists twice no that's not actually how it fool me once <laughs> anecdotal so 
anyway, she uh, she did recover. Thank goodness. Um, I'm sure the senator was very grateful. And the next year, she went along with the Surgeon General to visit Armstrong so that she could see him and thank him personally uh, for saving her life. And um, like, ask him, like, now that I have your blood running through my veins or what what relation are we? Yeah. It was all very, everyone laughed. Everyone yeah. loved it. It was a great thing. Uh, but of course, by that point, she wasn't visiting him at the hygienic laboratory. Hmm. Because... After all that mess with the parrot fever outbreak with the lab and the cyanide and how close that situation came, you know, from just this sort of hyped up media panic to an actual real panic, an yeah. actual real outbreak um, that finally inspired the government that, you know, I guess when you need something and when you know you really need it to work, you probably need to put some money and some support Mm -hmm. into that and uh, and put some effort behind it so that the next time something like this happens um these brave research scientists have what they need to you know address it head on to not get sick themselves and to you know inform the public and and keep everything at bay right so even though they have been lobbying for years and years and hadn't really gotten much of anywhere for this two months after the parrot fever panic, I guess. Congress finally listened to the hygienic laboratory. Uh, they passed legislation that gave them more power, a broader mandate. They gave them more money and they gave them a whole new name, the National Institute of Health. And there is the- And there now you know <laughs> the rest of the story. And that was officially the day that it became. Well, congratulations, N National Institute of Health. What a <laughs> journey. What a journey uh, that was. Um, Thank you again, Dr. Ratliff, for having us and, and everybody for for listening to us. Uh, if you like the show, we got our book, Sawbones, and uh, we got a podcast wherever, you know, you listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. If you do that, it's called Sawbones. You listen to it there. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to get to be here. Um, I usually travel in Justin's world of doing shows for, you know, your fans and stuff. So this is really cool. Yeah. To this be. is the closest we've gotten to, to a live show since uh, February of 2020. So what a, it's a thrill in that well, it's uh, really, regard as well. That's really exciting for me. Thank you all for all the work you do. And just thank you so much for having us. Well, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. That was a great story, but also very uh, terrifying story for especially for the parrots. It's sad that at the time there wasn't any animal ethics rules. <laughs> exactly, yeah. so, exactly. So for normally for scientific presentations, we have a Q&A session and people uh, put their questions in the chat box. So everyone, please feel free to uh, ask questions. Uh, and I also wanted to tell you that uh, while you were speaking, uh, there was a lot of conversation about liver doctors um, <laughs> that they yeah. said, and IDK has lots of liver doctors and we love jokes about liver doctors. And um, Dr. Afsali also uh, shared a poem um, about the liver. So <laughs> you can also read that. Um, <laughs> also, they also pointed that parrots need a liver doctor. So <laughs> I, I had a, I had just like simple question. Uh -huh. So this actually became the reason where NIH is, right? It's like if there wasn't any parrot fever outbreak, maybe NIH wouldn't be in the place that is right now. So what do you predict that if there wasn't any parrot fever, what would cause uh, the hygiene laboratory to become NIH? What would be the next thing? Oh, goodness. That's a tough question. Um... I don't know. I'm trying to think like chronologically because I, you know, I, this incident is really given like the credit for it happening right then. But there had been so much lobbying and effort to try to make this happen for such a long time. Um, you really have to imagine that at least under so much reorganization was done under FDR. I have to imagine by then that then it would have happened because there was so much more focus on public health and stuff at that point, that if it hadn't happened then, I, I would I would think by then this transition would have occurred. Okay, yeah. Um, and there is a fan of all McElroy podcasts here, Kelsey Betridge. So she's <laughs> asking, Kelsey. how does Toucan Dan fit in this story? Toucan Dan lost a lot of grandparents in the parrot fever outbreak. He had a lot of relatives in there. It's a dark, you never hear it in the Fruit Loops commercials, but he had a really dark history. So I'm, I, I'm glad that he doesn't have to relive it here today. Yeah. And what tips do you have for effective science communication? Oh, I'll feel this one. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, what has helped me a lot and actually through doing the podcast, I, Justin really does, he doesn't know what I'm going to talk about when we do these shows. And so he is sort of my audience. And so he asks me the questions that come naturally to him that he would want to know about. And that has really helped me think a lot more about my assumptions of what, um, in terms of like, well, no, I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, but no, like just, you, assumptions of like the language we use. The I've terms lowered we your use. standards no. for what, how, how, imagine you're telling the story to a child and now take it one step down for adjusted. And then that's about where you need to be. Well, I really, I try to assume that this is something that my, uh, that whoever I'm talking to has never looked into and doesn't know anything about and start from that basis. Um, and, and really tailor the language that I use. I try to think of, um, I spend a lot of time thinking of analogies for things like in science, it's this, but what's an interesting analogy or a way to, we did this recently for the, um, for the coronavirus vaccines. We were talking about how, why was it rushed, but not rushed scientifically. And the analogy we used was expedited delivery. When you pay extra for your package to get to you faster, you don't expect that your package would be broken or that you'd get the wrong thing. It just means that you paid to skirt some of the things that slow th packages down. And, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about analogies like that to communicate and then asking Justin, let me tell you something and then tell me if it makes sense. So I, he's key to that process. <laughs> yes, my uh, uh, simplicity. Let's, no, let's to be generous just, is, is a very important component it's of the not your Swan area. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a really great advice. I agree. Thank you. Thank um, you. And then there is another question: When you delve deeper into science topics, do you sometimes think it will be fun to be a scientist? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I that was actually uh, for me my pathway to medicine. I didn't start out thinking I would be like a clinician. I I thought. I wanted to be one of those microbe hunters that I read books about. <laughs> um, so I really thought I would be on the research side of things. Uh, but I just, I like talking to people so much. I talk so much. And I think that I spent a lot of time um, realizing how much I wanted to be talking about things and, and touching people and being with people. And then that sort of shifted my focus. But uh, yes, I think it would be so much fun. I, I loved the, uh, you know, like bench research that I've gotten to do throughout my training and my career. And um, I think it'd be a ton of fun. I don't know how you feel, but. No, no, it, it sounds boring, but I'm really glad there are people <laughs> to do it uh, for sure. Absolutely. Oh, it, it has some fun parts too, but yeah. Oh yeah, but I, I, I would imagine <laughs> many more boring parts. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no I, don't have the, I don't have the, you know what? I don't have the, um. It's funny with Sawbones, we tend to focus in on scientists during the exact moment where the entire work turns and everything comes together and it all clicks into place. I know me, I wouldn't have the patience to get through the thousand days of like it not clicking <laughs> into place. I would just want to skip to like the big revelation where everybody hails me as a, as a conquering hero. Yeah. Well, we have just two more minutes, but we have two more questions. So mm -hmm. if you could answer those. Um, Someone said, yes, did you have fun making the Gamer Danger episodes? <laughs> yeah, that was the episode we did, our last episode I researched and it was about, uh, rather than sitting to give her a break for her birthday, it was about mm -hmm. uh, uh, the various health hazards of video games. It was it was a little nerve wracking because it's not normally my uh, my role on the show, but it was, it was fun to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. It's, I got a notification on my phone, so I'm gonna check it out after the conference. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and the last question is, there are famous wild parrots in San Francisco, Telegraph heel parrots, lots of different theories about why they were set free escaped. Are they part of the story? Oh my gosh. I like I, the idea there was a, there was a few escapee parrots from the, from the cyanide building and they decided no, to live on the outskirts of society. Maybe these are parrots that were set free because uh, maybe, yeah. their owners yeah. didn't want to have them in their house. You know, I don't know that answer, but uh, that's the first thing I'm going to do when we're done here is go look that up because yeah. <laughs> that would be really cool. Well, thank you so much uh, for having, for just uh, doing this today. Um, we will move on to the next item on our agenda, but yeah, it was great thank to have you, you here. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, so for the breakout rooms, the poster presenters and for judges, I have a few announcements.